When synesthesia was first discovered in the 19th century, people assumed that it might be related to the eyes because people had already known about colour blindness in which people failed to discriminate, say, reds and greens. And it was assumed that maybe these people are seeing extra colours because they have some extra cells, say, on the back of their retina. This idea soon fell out of favour because people could experience the colours not only when they see and hear things, but also when they were thinking about, say, letters and numbers and so on. So it's generated by thoughts in the brain rather than things that are presented to the eyes and the ears. And another common idea in those days is that they were to do with mental imagery and learned associations between things that maybe were encountered in childhood, so linking back to early experiences. And these ideas also fell out of favour because it wasn't clear why some people had them and others didn't. Why, for instance, it was running in families when everybody's exposed to these kinds of uh, associations in their environment. Later on from this, people accepted that synesthesia existed, but they thought it was a trivial thing because all that had happened is that you might listen to a sound uh, and see a colour and then it becomes burned in the brain. So in the mid 20th century, th there was a root in psychology, a movement in psychology called uh, behaviourism. Uh, and people didn't dismiss the notion of synesthesia, but synesthesia just became very trivial because it was just seen as being something that anybody could have. So in the behaviourist tradition, all mental concepts such as conscious experience were, were thrown out and people were just interested in what went into the, the nervous system in terms of stimuli and what came out of the nervous system in terms of responses and actions and so on. So what people actually thought in their inner, inner lives was seen as being not part of this particular scientific process. Uh, and this took quite a long time to undo. So even in the 1960s and 70s, when behaviourism wasn't so entrenched in psychology, people tended to think of the mind in terms of computerised operations and so on. Uh, and in those ways of thinking, behaviourism didn't exist. But nevertheless, conscious experiences were still relegated and it's unclear what status they had. It was only in the 1980s and later that people actually became interested in conscious experiences uh, in a scientific way and considering what in the brain gives rise to these, aside from the fact of the brain is performing certain types of computations. So in the 1980s, there, there are two people who, uh, who could be credited with uh, giving synesthesia a certain legitimacy. So one was Richard Saitowik in the United States who was a neurologist and happened to just come across somebody who had synesthesia. So he went to a dinner party and somebody was uh, cooking a chicken sauce. He tasted the sauce and said, this sauce isn't wrong, it needs more points on it. Uh, and Richard Saitoic asked what he meant by this and he said that the shape of the, the sauce isn't right. So this person, whenever he tasted things, would experience shapes kind of on his hands and in the space outside his body. A few years later in the UK and, and independently, Simon Baron Cohen had come across a synesthete who'd placed an article in a magazine saying, I, I'm a painter and I experience uh, words and music as, as coloured. Is there anybody who's interested in studying me? Uh, and he replied to that and he, he published a number of papers about this person and about other cases that he came across. And he devised a test for showing that people with synesthesia have very precise mappings between words and colours. Uh, and far more so than, than other people who are asked to generate these using learned associations and so on. Uh, and this was one important step in the history of synesthesia because it was a test that could be apl applied, a very simple test, but it was good enough for, for telling people apart. Um, since, the, since this work in the 1980s, people have started to look at other types of synesthesia and really we don't even know how many types of synesthesia there are, there are convincingly because new ones are coming up all the time. Uh, so this has been one trend. But, but also people have looked at other ways of investigating synesthesia. So looking at what goes on in the brain of synesthetes, for example. So there's been an important shift away from proving that synesthesia is real towards actually understanding what synesthesia is, what the mechanisms are that, that causes it. So it's still important to have these tests to show that it's real, but really the research agenda's moved on from that and we're trying to understand what this actually means in terms of how, we, how the brain can create these experiences, what the experiences are useful for and what they tell us about how the normal mind and brain works.